Hey, okay, welcome to our lab today. I uh, just wanted to uh, repeat that uh, yesterday, the day of the test, on Monday, uh, June 1st, um, I decided to uh, skip over uh, this lab and then do a video of my uh, solutions to the test. So hopefully you got a chance to look at those, or at least you will, because I think they will uh, serve you well. Um, I mentioned the same thing in the, in the lecture part of it. Uh, so now let's do the ballistic pendulum uh, lab, the one that was scheduled for yesterday. It's a really good one because it involves uh, three principles that we've already uh, have uh, been discussing. Uh, as you'll see here in a moment, it's got conservation of energy, which is the chapter we just wrapped up in the lecture, uh, chapter 7, before we rolled into chapter 8. Uh, it's also got conservation of momentum, uh, which is the chapter before that, chapter 6. And it also has projectile motion, which is back into chapter uh, 4. And so it's really good uh, lab, I think, because it ties all those uh, together. And it's a, a fairly short lab. If this was face to face, I would say, hey, you guys aren't going to be here really for, for very long. And uh, I guess that would also be true uh, even uh, online here. So let me start with the whole idea of the ballistic pendulum. Uh, take your lab manual and go to page uh, 36 if you uh, uh, haven't already. And you'll see here that your author has a description. And uh, I'll put that description on the board. In fact, the description continues on on to page 37 and then he gives you the procedure. Uh, I'll just jump all the way to page 38 here and uh, notice that at the top of 38, maybe I'll, I'll just take this uh, paper out, but on the uh, top of uh, page 38 there's just a few lines to fill in the data. That, that, that's all we have to measure to get the projectile part, I mean the uh, ballistic pendulum part. And then there's only two things to measure when we do the what they, we call the uh, projectile uh, part of it. Um, and so I'll come back to that, but, but let's just talk about the general idea. Come, come over here to the board uh, with me, and I'm going to draw a couple of uh, pictures. Uh, I'm going to start with a uh, sphere. Uh, it's actually a, a ball bearing. Let me call it a cannonball. And let me call it mass sub B uh, for the mass of the, of the ball. And let's just say that that ball is moving with some speed, let's say V sub B for the velocity of the ball. And I just want to double check that this is the uh, same notation, yeah, that your uh, author uses. All right. So he does. I just wanted to check with that. And I'll show you how we're going to get the ball launched. We've got a little cannon, so we call this a cannon ball. And so maybe I'll put that in the picture. Back here is kind of a little uh, catcher and shooter machine that has this spring in it. And it launches out and shoots the ball. All right. So I'll demonstrate the equipment in just a second. But imagine that the cannonball is already moving and it's being shot towards a little ball catcher. Uh, we call this a pendulum. You'll see why here. In just a, a second. But this little opening catches the ball and since we call this a pendulum, let me call this M sub P, the, the mass of the a pendulum. And so if you kind of imagine this like a, a video frame by frame, let's call this frame number one. Because frame number two then is when the ball actually gets lodged into the pendulum, or the, the ball catcher here, we now would have the mass of the ball and the mass of the pendulum as one object, if you will. And so now they're hooked together. And this object would go moving at some speed, uh, let's call it V sub P for the velocity of the, of the pendulum. And I'm sure you can imagine that that speed would be a little bit less or a lot less depending on how much mass this object is that it comes colliding into. But this is the first main principle I want to talk about. Uh, my hint towards you, and I, and I hope you did it during the exam, was that if you ever see two things interacting like this, colliding together, 
hopefully the first thing that goes on in your, in your brain is, ah, collision and interaction, and that means the momentum before equals the momentum after. So this is part of the principle. Let me write that out as an equation here. So in between frame one and frame two, I would say, okay, here is the mass of the ball, the speed of the ball, and the pendulum is stationary. And so when I add up the momentum of the two of these objects, I really only need this first one. So this is the momentum of the first one. Of course, then they collide and stick together, so you would say they're both moving at the same speed, or maybe another way of saying the same thing is to say that uh, we can think of it now as one object, where that one object is the, you know, the two of them added together, moving with some speed p. And so this is going to be, as you'll see here, one of the important principles. This is the conservation of, of momentum. But I would say also another thing happening at the same time is our energy principle. And so as you guys saw me uh, working out some example problems, not today's lecture, but uh, yesterday's lecture near the end, I said, look, to answer some of these, don't just use energy or just use momentum, but both are going on at the same time. So let me write down a second equation here. So not only is the momentum before equal to the momentum after the collision, but the energy before is equal to the energy after. All right, so a second equation, and maybe a good place for it might be, we're just right under here, but give myself a little bit of space to work. I would say before the collision, what I have is kinetic energy of the ball only. And so remembering from class that kinetic energy is one half mv squared, this is how I would calculate the kinetic energy before. And since this one's not moving, it would have zero. So this is the total kinetic energy before the collision. It's also the total energy. Now, when it makes an impact, this will start moving, but also as the ball gets lodged into this pendulum, there's going to be some rubbing going on. And that rubbing is then going to make the molecules move faster. And that's an energy, that's a heat. So remember that conservation of energy says that the total energy before equals the total energy after. It does not say the kinetic energy before equals the kinetic energy after. So I need to be careful over here and make sure that when I go to calculate the total energy, I make sure I include both forms of energy after the collision. The form is kinetic because this is going to be moving, but there's also going to be some heat. So again, this is the chapter 6, this is the chapter 7, conservation of energy here, conservation of momentum. Now let me draw the next frame. Because you can imagine that if this is what it was on what I call frame number 2, then it would swing upward. And that's why we call this a, a pendulum. And before I draw the, the next frame, this would probably be a good time to actually show you the equipment. Uh, and so here is our equipment. This is the part that I'm talking about catches the ball. This is the part that swings. This is the pendulum part. Uh, let me just hook it out of the way. Let me take my can in this. This is the cannon part and so it doesn't slide or move on me. I'll kind of clamp it to the table. Uh, let me take then a cannon ball and load it in here. And so I'll just push it all the way in. And I'll just show you a launch right here, but here's what happens if I pull this up. It fires this cannonball out. Okay, and so the, the, the frame I have drawn here was, here's the ball going really fast, and it's about to impact into here, and then it impacts into here, and then of course it's going to swing up. 
Hey, watch, you can, you can see that. And so here we go. If you could imagine a little video here that if I fire this, it will go into the pendulum and then the pendulum will swing up. All right, so back to our picture here. So yeah, if this is, again, picture number one right before the impact. Uh, this is picture number two right after uh, the impact. And so picture number three is that the ball catcher that used to be here, the pendulum, with the ball in it, has now swung up to here. And so it goes slower as it is swinging up. And this is that principle of conservation of energy again. See, remember, the reason it goes up and gains gravitational potential energy is because over here it had kinetic energy. So if I say that this object moved upward, some height h, then using the principle of conservation of energy, I would say the one half mass of the ball plus mass of the pendulum times the velocity of the pendulum squared. Okay, so this is the kinetic energy part of it. I should emphasize this is not the whole energy, right? The, the whole energy is what it started with right here. And so this is what I'd call the initial energy. So that after the impact, this initial energy, some of it went to heat and some of it went to kinetic energy after the collision. And so we'll be asked to calculate those real soon. The part that went into kinetic, this part, then as it swings up, goes into potential energy. And so the equation for potential energy is the MGH. And in this case, the M would be the two added together, the pendulum and the, and the ball. All right, so this is my conservation of energy. So you might say I'm doing conservation of energy really twice, although really this is the following the energy of what was the fraction of the original energy. But nonetheless, I have a nice little equation here using conservation of energy and twice. So based on this, I have conservation of energy twice and conservation of momentum once. And our goal then is to figure out a number of things. Uh, so I shouldn't say it's just one goal, but maybe the major goal is to find out what is the speed of the ball before the collision based upon really how high did it swing up after the impact. And as I was saying here, what I think is really cool about this lab is you're asked to measure, I think it's only three things. Let me just kind of check page 38. Yeah, you're, you're basically asked to measure the mass of the ball, the mass of the pendulum, and then how high did the pendulum go. And from that, you could calculate a whole slew of, of, of different things here. And so let me begin the experiment and say, all right, here's what I need to measure. I need to measure these three things. Uh, and I'll write them in the same order that's in here. The first one says, what is the mass of the ball? Okay. The second one says, what is the mass of the pendulum? Okay. The last one says, what is its vertical rise of the pendulum? And I'll put that there. But to really get that one, they've given you a spot to get what 
you'll see here is the angle that it swings up. Uh, your author calls it the pendulum position. Um, I guess position is an okay word. And he asks you to measure it three times. So I'll put three little spaces there so we can get an average. And then, of course, once we get the average, we can use that to get this vertical rise. Okay, well, maybe I'll just go in the same order that it is shown here on your piece of paper. So let me actually fire it and watch it swing up. Let's come back to the equipment here. I, uh, I don't know if you, if you noticed this, but this cannonball, once it's loaded into here, and this pendulum is moved down into the, I'll call it the starting location, there is a little, what I like to call a marker, a slider. This is the thing that is going to tell me how high does it swing up. In fact, let me put it at about 20 degrees for starters. Because watch what happens when I fire this. This will swing up and it will move this up to the maximum angle before the pendulum stops rising and falls back down. So count of three, one, two, three, I fire it and sure enough, it pushes my marker up, and so if I take a reading of this, I get 37 and a, 37 and a half degrees. So 37 and a half degrees. And so your instructions from your author says, do this three times, so we have a reasonable average. Okay, so let's fire it a second time. One, two, three, fire. And it fired this time 37 degrees. Okay, let me fire it one more time. So we'll lower it down. Place the marker about 20 degrees, good place to start, because I know it'll push it past that. And so finally the third time is 37 degrees. So on average it is 37, oh a third makes it six, is that one six? Not a hundred percent sure on that. So why don't I grab my calculator. So 37 plus 37 plus 37 and a half divided by 3 is 37.16, repeating forever. Yeah. Okay. So there's the average. So that's really the first half of this experiment. But like I said, we, we need some more data. And that angle really is telling me how high it went up. All right, so let's see if we can figure out how high it goes up. And that's what the little ruler here is for. And so as I fire it into here, and it swings up to this 37 degrees, so I'll just put a little marker there, I want to know how high it went up. Now let me be careful here. Because when it swings up, I'm going to do something like this. I'm going to use my ruler to measure from the tabletop. So I'll tell you what I, I better do before I do that is I need to find out how high the object is from the tabletop to even begin with. And I don't have the best angle, but I think it looks like the yellow dot there, which is the center of mass, is nine centimeters above the table. And so if I drew a picture over here and say, okay, this is the table, it's already starting at nine centimeters above the table. So when it goes up to some height, I'll subtract those two to figure out what the H is, that is the, the vertical rise, how much higher did it go. So I don't have a partner. 
here. But I think a reasonable measurement here is 14. Let's see, is that at 37? Then I'll just hold it at 37. Ah, 14. I can't really say if that was 0.4 or 0.5. I'll go with 0.5. All right. So let me call this 14.5 centimeters. So if I subtract these two, this would tell me this vertical rise is 5.5 centimeters. That's why we, you know, average these, held it at that spot, and measure the vertical rise. Now, I will also point out the same thing that I did in lecture, that if we're calculating energies, and, and we're going to be asked to do that, uh, make sure that you have your mass in kilograms, your distance in meters, and your time in seconds. So, I'm going to take the 5.5 centimeters and convert it into meters because I know that they're going to be asking things about how much energy the energy is then calculated in joules and joules needs meters okay so oh just check still thumb on yeah okay so the uh, where was I oh yeah so the mass uh, it needs to be in kilograms also, and the vertical rise needs to be in meters. So I just did that. Now the other two things are, are really kind of easy. They're just the, the mass. So let me grab the uh, cannonball here. And we have a scale off to the side here. Uh, some of them have a Petri dish on it. This one does not, but maybe I'll just grab... Uh, yeah, I'll just grab this uh, masking tape here. And maybe the first thing I need to do is make sure it's, it's on here. But, um, so the ball doesn't roll off. I need to, you know, hold it into place. And then I'll just re-zero it, terror here. There it goes, took a while. All right, so I'm reading zero. And so if I put the cannonball in there and kind of let it settle down, it looks like it's saying 65.6 .6 grams. All right. So I will first write down 65.6. Uh, but that's grams, so let me move the decimal place 3. And so that is the mass of the ball in kilograms. And I'll say it again. Notice I'm putting kilograms because when we calculate energy, we want mass in kilograms, distance in meters, and time in seconds. Okay, the other thing we need is the mass of this pendulum. And that's why it's designed to come apart without the ball in it. Oh, well, these were a little loose. Hopefully they didn't shake it up too much. But let's get the mass of this one. And so let me take these off. So let me re-tear it. There we go. Give it a while. This is a little slow. There it goes. And put this on here. All right, so this says 239.9 grams. So I mean over here, uh, 200. 39.9 grams. Move it three, one, two, three. And so it'd be 0.2399 kilograms. All right. So that's the, the raw data. And like I was saying, one thing kind of neat about this is just that information alone is going to allow us to calculate all kinds of things like what's the momentum what is the energy what is the kinetic energy what is the total energy what is the heat energy uh, what is the speed of the of the ball and at the risk of doing too much for you uh, let's talk a little bit about this because as you look on page 38 they say let's do some calculations 
And the first one is, what is the potential energy of the ball at the end of the swing? They give you the equation, and I'll give it to you also. Maybe I'll change uh, to a different color so you can kind of see it here. Oh, wait, I already put some on the here. But let's calculate this right here. And so, of course, you will need those three things we just measured. The mass of the ball, the mass of the pendulum, and the height. Now you have the... I'll just put a number one right here. Your first calculation. I'll help you with number two. It's supposed to be easy, but I know in a face-to-face -face setting, I get a lot of questions on this. And maybe because it's so easy, students are thinking, I don't think this is what the author is asking. But the is asking. And number two, the author just says, so what was the kinetic energy right now? Here's number two. Don't calculate anything. Maybe what confuses students is the author gives them a little formula there. But don't calculate anything. What the author wants me just to write is the principle of conservation of energy. Well, the author for number two. <laughs> Don't do anything more. And that's just trying to drive home conservation of energy. That's the lesson from chapter seven. And so that's why I think he just kind of makes it a simple question, but a direct question. Will you just write that down? Okay. Despite the fact that that often confuses students, it's a really good uh, question. We continue with number three. So Kind of cool about this. Energy after. Oh, look at number four. Four goes on to say, okay, if you got the speed, you can also find the momentum. All right, so let me come over here. That would be. to be this easy. Number five, he's just saying, what is the momentum before the collision? Well, now remember, you just did step four, which says, what is the momentum after the collision? So don't miss that, because this is a big part. He just wants you to write down the same number. He wants you to realize that momentum before is equal momentum after. Okay? So don't pendulum. This is
hate to age here, but you know, I'm old enough to remember when the dinosaurs were walking around on the earth. And although I joke about that, uh, I do remember doing this exact experiment with a real 22 rifle. That was how we did it in those days. We'd come in and we'd out. because it's on
talking about the 